Good morning, my friends. Man, it is so good to see y'all. And those of y'all that I don't see but that are out there, I'm just glad that everyone's there. Some of y'all are staying safe at home, but we're glad that you're joining us. Um, live stream, the rest of you, we're glad that you're here. It makes Sabbath joyful to see our people gathering and being here together. And so we got a great topic today. Uh, but before that, I believe that we are going to start our outdoor church for the spring um, in two weeks. I'm not sure on that. I got to check with the availability, but not this coming Sabbath, but the next. We are going to do the outdoor church again with the music, singing, a short message um, in the evening. Hmm? No, not in place of church, right. It's, we do it at, for, you, for those of you that don't know, we go to Barton Park, right, just right down the road, about 6 o'clock, and we just have a Vesper service. So we're probably going to start that again. Um, also, we had a great time at Abide this week. Uh, Victor Jr., where is he? Man, he did a great job with um, looking at the signs of the times, the end of the world. We all had some good Bible study time together. So I invite you all to come to that. Uh, if you want to just get a little midweek upcharge, it was a it was a good experience this week. And so now we're going to turn to where we've been going in the book of Daniel. I changed the title, <laughs> by the way, to the righteousness of God. When I got done writing in about the fourth uh, the fourth rough draft through, I thought, no, this needs to be the title, the righteousness of God. Daniel in chapter seven, if you've noticed. When we was done in chapter 7, he was still a bit unclear about the judgment. He had seen it, but he wasn't for sure what was going on. In Daniel 8, God made it real clear to Daniel what was the thrust of what he was trying to say. The fall festivals were going to begin in time. Uh, the Day of Atonement, the Day of Judgment we talked about, and with trumpets and tabernacles. And Daniel was excited about that, but there's still some ambiguity because it seems like through the first eight chapters of Daniel, God is focusing on the Day of Atonement, the fall festivals, all to take place uh, around September, October. But that would cause a little uh, confusion in Daniel's mind because before you can get to the fall festivals, you have to have the experience of the spring festivals, right? And typologically speaking, before we can get to the Day of Atonement, the Passover lamb from God has to come to earth, go to the sanctuary on earth, and then go to the, back to the sanctuary in heaven, and then in time the Day of Atonement could start. Well, God hasn't mentioned a thing about the spring festivals. He's mentioned nothing really about Passover beginning, unleavened bread, uh, the wave sheaf, the Feast of Pentecost, typologically being fulfilled. So this is where Daniel chapter 9 comes in. God really takes the picture and blows it up and helps him to understand that this is going to happen first. So last week we was in Daniel 8, and Daniel, if you remember, was doing what Daniel does. He's by the river Uli, right? And he is studying, he is contemplating. Well, in Daniel chapter 9, we find him doing the same thing. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 1, in the first year of Darius, the son of Azaharius, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Now this is like, this is, this is what Daniel is always up to. This is classic Daniel. He's constantly doing what? He is studying. He is never not seen and studying. In fact, every time God reveals something to Daniel, it's always through his study and his meditation. And now he is in the book of Jeremiah who was the old man of the times, and so he was studying all the things that Jeremiah had wrote, and this is why Nebuchadnezzar said of Daniel that he had an excellent spirit in him. The spirit of the holy gods was in him because he was constantly searching for what God had to reveal to him. You think he's a prophet, why would a prophet need to study? But this prophet, this prophet was always studying, and every time Daniel begins to study, God starts to reveal to him, and what he's going to reveal to him is what he's been waiting for. What about the spring holy days? What about the Passover? When is that going to begin? And so before we can get into that, though, before Daniel can be shown this view of the temple, and that's what Daniel 9 is generally, we think of it to be about, before he's going to do that, he has to allow Daniel to get into a certain mind frame. 
Because Daniel 9 is unlike any of the chapters that we have looked at before. There is a holiness to Daniel the ninth chapter. There is a spirit and a mindset that one has to come into before you can walk into the temple service in the ninth chapter of Daniel. And that is exactly what God is going to allow Daniel to do. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 3, before he reveals to him the famous 70-week prophecy, Daniel says, Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplications with fasting sackcloth and ashes. Now this is always alerting us in the Old Testament to a symbol of deep, deep repentance. It is a symbol of one dying to his self. Right? Dead men don't eat. That's why they fast. And dead men are, are symbolized with sackcloth, a symbol of mourning and a symbol of ashes. Remember God told, told Adam after his sin, from ashes you were and ashes that you're going to return. And so Daniel is, is, is returning to that mindset of God. He's allowing that, that heaviness of heart to come upon him, that weeping of spirit. He's allowing God, he's showing God that I understand what we are. That I understand, and that's going to make a lot of sense in the next few verses. And out of this, this sackcloth, this weeping, this honesty about what the human race is, as he's coming under this awareness and this heaviness of soul, in verse 4, his heart erupts into prayer. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant with mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. Daniel is confessing his sin. He's getting in touch with the reality of what the human race is, what his own people are, what they have done and what he has done. He has offended his God, but God is also a God that keeps covenant and gives mercy. And he says that, yes, we have sinned and we'll see in a minute, but you are a covenant keeping God. You are a merciful God. You are a great God of mercy is actually what he has just said. And this is where we begin to see the early ideas of justification by faith that Paul would work out later. That we are in sackcloth, we are in ashes, we are confessing people, and God is a God of mercy. God is a God that will justify the man that understands he belongs in sackcloth and ashes. But there is something more in that text, and I, it's passed over me most of my life until recently looking at this. Does this sound familiar? His covenant and mercy with those who love him and keep his commandments. Does that sound familiar? You know, we're John now in Revelation chapter 14, 12, the three angels' message, especially the third angel's message. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. John is grabbing his language, most of his language, out of the book of Daniel. And so immediately you should be alerted to, to what Daniel is saying or what John is pointing back to, that this is the third angel's message. Daniel chapter 9 is the third angel's message. And when you see the prayer and when you see the bigger ideas about the prophecy, you'll realize that this is exactly what is going on. In fact, when we talk about the third angel's message, I want to be clear. And so I'm going to use a text from Spirit of Prophecy so that there's no confusion of what John is talking about and what Daniel is setting us up for here in just a moment. Several have written to me inquiring the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message. And I have answered, it is the third angel's message in verity. It presents an uplifted Savior. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior. The sacrifice for the sins of the whole world, it presented justification through faith in the surety. It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. Many had lost sight of Jesus. They needed to have their eyes directed to his divine person, his merits, his changeless love for the human family. All power is given into his hands that he may dispense rich gifts unto men, imparting the priceless gift of his own righteousness to the helpless human agent. This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. It is the third angel's message, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and attended with the outpouring of his spirit in a large measure. This is Daniel chapter 9, the opening ideas. And as we go through the chapter, it is the third angel's message. It is what John is drawing for from when he writes the great chapters of Revelation chapter 14. And watch what comes out of this verse. Watch what erupts out of his prayer and see the three angels' message, especially the third angel's message, come pouring out of the text. Let's start again with verse 5 through 7. Daniel says, we have sinned. Now keep your gospel eyes open. Think about all the things we've talked about and what the gospel is. 
We have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Neither, verse 7, O Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to us, what? Shame of face, as it is this day to men of Judah, to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, those near and those far off, all the countries to which you have driven them because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. O Lord, to us belongs shame of face. To our kings, our princes, and our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord God to walk in his ways, which he has set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yes, all Israel has transgressed your law and is departed so as not to obey your voice. Therefore, the curse. And the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, has been poured out on us because we have sinned against him. Verse 12, and he has confirmed his words which he spoke against us, against our judges who judged us by bringing upon a great disaster. For under the whole heaven such as never has been, has been done as what has been done to Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us. Yet we have not made our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. Therefore, the Lord has kept the disaster in mind and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works which he does, though we have not obeyed his voice. Daniel, the ninth chapter, forms the entire framework for the book of Romans, for the book of Hebrews, and for the book of Revelation. It is the entire idea of righteousness by faith is right there with all those words. We have sinned. There is a law that has condemned us. We are under its curse. We are not righteous. You alone are righteous. We have been judged rightly by our judges. But you have mercy. You have pardon. You have forgiveness. You alone are righteous. We are not righteous. You alone are good. We are not good. You alone are righteous. And we have nothing but shame of face in your presence. That is Daniel's message. That is actually the third angel's message. Or at least how it begins anyway. Man is deserving of a punishment of death because he has violated the law of God. But Daniel says you will forgive and pardon based upon what you have done. And not only that, but this is kind of, this is the bunny trail a bit, but I'm only going to stay on it for a little bit. When the gospel is rejected, there is always something else rejected along with it. In verse 6. I started to read it a minute ago, but here we go. Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes and to our fathers and to all the peoples of the land. In verse 10, he said it again. We have not heeded the servants, your prophets. There was a spirit of prophecy that has always attended the proclamation of the gospel from the time of Adam all the way through the end of time. There will always be the prophetic gift ex uh, exemplified in a church that's preaching the third angel's message. And whenever that gospel is rejected, you can best rest assured the spirit of prophecy is also rejected. Now, I want to stop there for a bit. If we as a church would have just taken the Conflict of Ages series, right? Patriarchs and Prophets, Prophets and King, Desire of Ages, Acts of the Apostles, and Great Controversy. Just that work which forms the framework of the gospel. Taking the entire gamut of the scriptures and boil it down into what does righteousness by faith mean in all five of those volumes if we had stuck to just those if we're going to read anything outside of the bible if we would have just stuck to those readings our church would never be as confused as it is today about what the gospel is we would never be sucking down protestant theology that comes from outside the world into here we would never in a moment in an instant anytime someone stood up here and began puppeting something from outside the world someone would have stood up and said whoa wait a minute I don't know what gospel that is, but it's not the gospel of this church. But when you throw out the gospel, you throw out the spirit of prophecy, the parameters, the protectors, the boundaries that keep us in the gospel, in the scriptures. Three times in his prayer, he says, Lord, we need a righteousness that we do not have. In fact, Paul answers that cry from Daniel and he opens his entire writings in Romans with that very idea that Daniel is praying to God that we need righteousness, but we don't have it. 
Listen, in Romans chapter 1, some of the most beautiful things ever said to mankind. Verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. It is written, the just shall live by faith. The power of God is the gospel. And the power of the gospel is the message of righteousness that comes from God, not a righteousness that is generated from man. And that is what Daniel is admitting in his prayer from the beginning. Lord, we have no righteousness. You alone have righteousness. And the gospel tells us how we can obtain that righteousness, specifically the gospel revealed in the sanctuary message, specifically through those feast days that we've been studying, specifically through the high priestly ministry of Christ, man can understand where real righteousness comes from. And therefore, Daniel would say, because we need righteousness, because you have it, Verse 17, back to chapter 9 of Daniel. Now, therefore, our God, hear the prayer of your servant and supplications, and for the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine where? Woo, on your sanctuary that is desolate. Cause your face to shine upon your sanctuary. In that sanctuary, Lord, we are going to learn how we as a people can have the righteousness that we need to have eternal life. That is Daniel chapter 9. That is the message. And that is why Seventh-day Adventists have such a focus on this heavenly sanctuary revealed through the law of Moses, revealed all the way through scriptures, the prophets, the minor prophets, the New Testament, the book of Hebrews, and down into the book of Revelation, which, by the way, the entire framework of Revelation is built on the sanctuary paradigm. So Seventh-day Adventists, this is our work to prepare people to have the light of the sanctuary shine upon on them because that is what's going to save them from the delusions out there in the world. And we see that clearly that that is our message. Now, we usually go to Revelation 14 to to describe this, but I'm going to go to Daniel where John gets it from. And tell me if this sounds familiar to you. In verse 20 of 23 and 23, 20 through 23, tell me if you hear anything that sounds remotely like Revelation 14 here. Now, while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin... And the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord, my God, for the holy mountain of my God. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. And he informed me and talked with me and said, oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. Does that sound at all like Revelation Chapter 14, verse 6, For I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven. He sees an angel, Gabriel, flying swiftly, comes to give him a message that he is going to proclaim to the world. Revelation 14, 6, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach, to proclaim. It's the same thing. John's just writing much later, 600 years later, but he's grabbing it right from here. This is the third angel's message that goes to the world, that Gabriel's about to explain to him what you need to know about righteousness. And to miss this in Daniel chapter 9, if we miss this, if we miss this in Revelation 14, we're only left with a weird statement that says, Oh, God's judgment's going to begin. I mean, really, when you say that, when we get to Revelation 14, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. And we skip what Daniel is trying to tell us. If we leave out the gospel, all we have is this weird statement that a judgment's going to begin sometime in heaven. And everyone's like, yeah, okay, of course that's true. But when we bring in Daniel's prayer and we understand that what is being preached next what, God, what Gabriel explains to him next is exactly what the everlasting gospel of the first angel is all about. It's much more than just there's a judgment that begins. Now, with our minds geared toward this righteousness by faith, we can go into the prophetic text part of it. But we're going to take a little bit different look at this prophecy called the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel. In a typical Daniel 9 presentation, you know what we do in prophecy, right? If you've been to a prophecy seminar, you know that we use Daniel chapter 9 as the start date for the 2300-year prophecy in Daniel 8. Because Gabriel never tells him when it begins, he just tells him what it is. 
And so as a church, we recognize Daniel 9 is Gabriel coming to explain to him when the 2300-year prophecy begins. And you know the, the date, right? 457 B.C. in the book of Ezra, chapter 7, is the command to go back and restore Jerusalem. And Gabriel said that's when you'll mark the time period to start to get to the 2300-year consummation, 1844. But also, at the same time that that prophecy begins in Daniel chapter 9, there's another prophecy called the 70-week prophecy of Messiah, or the 490-year prophecy. And we started at the same time, and we go all the way down to, to 27 A.D., and then to 31 A.D., and then to 34 A.D. You know the numbers, right? If you don't, then you can pick this up on any Doug Batchelor video. You can, you can get this kind of information anywhere, the chart and the math and the paradigm. But today what I want to do is to bring out the gospel which the math is subservient to and not get lost in the mathematics and the numbers, but really look at what the purpose of the prophecy was given for. And it was to teach the human race what is righteousness and what is not. And so now let's get into the 70 weeks prophecy. And I'm going to skip around a little bit just for the sake of getting the juice of it. We pick up in verse 25. Now, therefore, no one understand that from the command of going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah, the prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks and the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. And in our prophecy seminars, which we will do in spring, we'll go over this kind of mathematically. But the part that must have amazed Daniel is for the first time he realizes that Messiah is going to show up. That would have been, would have been amazing to Daniel. That even, much, even more amazing than the atonement that he was talked about in Daniel chapter 8. In Daniel chapter 9, it's the high priest. Before the high priest comes, the Lamb of God comes. And what would have amazed Daniel is that he realizes that the Passover is about to begin. You know, they did 15, by the time of Daniel, they had 1,000 Passovers. And he was looking forward to the heavenly Passover, when the spring festivals would begin. And all of a sudden now, God has just told him that from this start date that ends in the atonement is also the time period when Messiah is going to show up. He's just given him the time and the date of the Messiah's arrival, his anointing by John and his sacrifice. In fact, Romans chapter 5, verse 19 really sums up Daniel 9, verse 25, what the Messiah would do, what the Passover lamb would do when he gets here. Romans 5, verse 19, For as by one man's disobedient many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. This is what Daniel is seeing. He is seeing the Messiah that will show up that will make man righteous. And that would have got him excited because he just spent an entire, entire afternoon praying to God that we are not righteous. We know we need to be. You are righteous. How do we get that righteousness, God, that we might have eternal life? Well, God's already showed him Messiah is going to show up. So how does he make us righteous? Oh, this is so beautiful. Verse 24. All right. We're gonna, not going to go over the 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. We'll save that for the for the for September. But here we go. How does he make us righteous? To finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. There are some things there that we've got to look at and not take for granted. What does it mean? How does the Messiah bring in everlasting righteousness by finishing the transgression? What does it mean to finish the transgression? I want you to think about this for a minute. I had trouble with this looking at it. What does it mean to finish the transgression? And I used to think, well, it just means he's going to forgive our sins. That's not what that means. There could be no higher transgression, what we call sin, than for God to allow sin to fully show its face at Calvary. To finish the transgression means that God would allow the worst kind of transgression that could ever take place. And that is the created being to kill the creator. That is a demonstration. This phrase means that God would allow sin to be seen for what it really is. That it would kill God himself if he could get his hands around God's throat. 
And so to finish the transgression means God is going to send Jesus to the earth and Jesus is going to sit there, remember, like a, like a lamb that goes to the slaughter. He's not going to answer for himself. He's not going to take up for himself. He's not going to defend himself. He's going to say, Satan, do your worst. Go ahead and finish this thing. Finish the transgression. Show the universe what sin is all about. We think that we have seen the worst, but Calvary actually was the worst. As bad as this world is, he would not only finish the transgression, but he would make an end of sins. And this is beautiful. Right? We live in a world where you try to make an end of sin in your life, but people don't let you, do they? You make mistakes. You say things that you shouldn't. You even do things that you regret and you lament and you say, man, look, I'm sorry for that. We live in a world that will allow you to bury the hatchet but leave the handle sticking out. But the gospel message is like, no, God has no handles. Right? In the Old Testament sanctuary, we talked about that like in Finham back a few months ago, that I can come into that sanctuary which represents the gospel I can take my sin, I can confess it upon the animal. My sin goes to the animal, the animal is slain, the sin transfers to his blood, and from his blood it goes to the altar. From the altar, at the end of the day, it went into the veil of the holy place. And at the end of the year, it went by the hand of a strong man, the scapegoat taken out into the wilderness to die. And that way the sin was purged out from the camp. And we're told in the book of Hebrews, this was representing how God would deal with Damon's need sin. I would transfer it from me to the blood of the Lamb. And then that blood, that represented, those droplets represented the sin of my life. And those would go to the veil, which Hebrews 10, 25 says is the flesh of Christ. And they would stay there to the day of atonement when they are taken out by the strong man through the scapegoat and there forever be separated as far as the east is from the west. He would make an end of my sins. And then he would make reconciliation for iniquity. In fact, Romans chapter 5 really says it better than any commentary an old pastor can give. Listen to this, Romans chapter 5. How does he make reconciliation for my sin that he wants to remove? Romans chapter 5 verse 6. For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Do you see the gospel? of righteousness by faith coming out of the prophecy. But there is something else. In verse 26, it says this, that Messiah shall be down towards the end. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 26, it's just, it says that he shall be cut off, but not from himself. And it's, look, we let these little phrases get by us. So I looked up and said, well, I know what it means he's going to be cut off. He's going to die. But where does Daniel get this? Look, all New Testament writers go to the prophets, the prophets go to Moses, and the prophets go to other prophets. So where does Daniel get this phrase from that he shall be cut off? Because that's where you get the deeper understanding of what it means. Daniel's just giving you the shorthand. He thinks you're a good Bible student. He thinks you already know where this phrase comes from. So you should snap right to it. Isaiah 53. Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. Verse 8. For he was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was, what? Cut off from the land of the living. And for the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. So, so okay, now we got to look, what is Isaiah saying? I don't know if you have paraphrased versions, it comes out a little clearer. But what he was saying, that he, he was taken from, he was put in prison for my sake, and he was, he was not given a fair judgment. 
He was given an unfair trial because he was innocent, because he didn't belong to be in prison. But God allowed him to have a judgment. Judgment was taken away from him is what it means. And that's how he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. And who shall declare his generation? Who would stand up for him is what that means. Who would stand up for Christ on that day in Gethsemane? Who would stand up for him in Pilate's court? Who would stand up for him on Calvary? Nobody. No one would declare his generation. But he does declare my generation. He declares me before the Father. I am the one that deserves to be in prison. And Paul, Romans 6, says that we are enslaved. We are all in prison. But he came and delivered me from prison by declaring me before the Father, by declaring my life before the Father as righteous even though I'm not. And then Daniel chapter 9, the part that we're getting to, remember? He kept asking, where does righteousness come from? You have righteousness, we have shamed face. Daniel must have been so excited because it says he will bring in, verse 24, everlasting righteousness. Now, I couldn't say it any better than Ellen White would say it this way. What is everlasting righteousness? Every soul may say, by his perfect obedience, he has satisfied the claims of the law, and my only hope is found in looking to him as my substitute and surety who obey the law perfectly for me. By faith in his merit, I am free from the condemnation of the law. He clothes me with his righteousness, which answers all the demands of the law. I am complete in him who brings in everlasting righteousness. I am complete in his righteousness. Daniel understood it. Yeah, Daniel talked about obedience, he talked about being faithful, but he understood the highest claims of the law is that man must be perfectly righteous. And Daniel knew that man cannot be perfectly righteous. But there was one that was perfectly righteous. You know, we get so caught up in the numbers of Daniel. Mary has this t-shirt, and actually I'm proud of it, right? I like this t-shirt. It, it, it does have meaning, it has place. But it says on the back, what is, your, what is your history? And on the front, it has 538, 34, 1844, 31, 27, 457, 1798, 408. You know, if you've been to prophecy seminars, all these mathematical numbers have meaning. They deal with, with all kinds of things. And we're very proud of the numbers. And we get so caught up in the numbers, we forget what the numbers are trying to tell us. The numbers are just setting the stage. They're just the platform, the paradigm from which the gospel comes. That at a certain time from 457 B.C., in 27 A.D., in 31 A.D., in 34 A.D., I am going to set to the world a true knowledge about what righteousness is. But we get so caught up in the numbers, we forget to give the gospel. Whew. The first question I ever asked critically about my church, I was in DeRitter, Louisiana, and we rented it out to the Mennonite group. And when the Mennonites showed up, the house was packed. It was standing room only. People were parked in the ditch. A typical Saturday for us was 20 cars in the parking lot, three quarters of the church empty. And when I saw that, that Sunday morning, I was the deacon in charge. I went into the library of the church and I wept. And I remember the first time I looked up out those windows at the parking lot and I said, God, what is wrong with my church? What is wrong with my church? We have the most beautiful message. Why is it that we can't draw the world to it? You've told us that that is our job. And now all these years later, I understand why. We, we was given the framework, the mathematics, but we wasn't bringing them the gospel. We thought they knew the gospel. The Bible says they do not know the gospel. That's why I've called you to tell them the gospel. And now I know why my mama and the daddy left the church early on, three, four years into the message. They heard the math. They heard the numbers. But when they needed the gospel to ground them, how many marriages did you know? They come into the church. They know the numbers. 
But they needed the gospel to save their marriage, to save their family, to save their kids. I don't know about you, but I am tired of watching churches split and people mad and leave and go. There is a gospel behind these numbers, in front of these numbers, all around these numbers, that if we're faithful to proclaim, people won't leave. Their marriages will be whole. A church will be right. I remember telling Miss Kelly, my algebra teacher, <laughs> I was always a little vociferous. And we was into some kind of equations, and I was like, Miss Kelly, what in the world am I ever going to use this for? I can't remember last week, so you think I'm going to remember this when, I'm a, when I graduate in just a, a year? And she said, Damon Sneed. And then she started telling me about applied mathematics, the application of the math. And I remember like, okay, whatever. I ended up becoming an electrician. <laughs> and 25 years later, I'm taking my master's exam, and I understood the math. I had to go back and, and like refresh myself with the math because the math is used for the formulas, which gives you light in application. Adventists, it's time that we take the math and apply it to the gospel. It is absolutely time that as a church we never ever again leave out the gospel from the atonement message from 1844, from the 70 weeks prophecy. It's time we learn how to do that, by the way. It's been a lot longer than 25 years. Now to those of you that are new to this church, in the year 1888, we had this famous conference in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And it was the church's attempt to reorientate everything we believe from the numbers to the gospel. It was an attempt of this church to correct the course where we were getting just so dry on proof texting. It was an attempt to take righteousness by faith and reorientate everything that we believe and know towards that. And here we are, 133 years, and we couldn't be further from that day than we were the day we began. Because we've abdicated, we've abandoned it for easy things to preach. Look, this sanctuary message is nothing that you're going to pick up and learn in 30 minutes. It is something that, like Daniel, you have to be looking and searching. But the Bible says, blessed is he who hungers and thirsts for righteousness, for you shall be filled. God will show us, God will teach us if we continue as a denomination to ignore our God-given message to the world, we will find ourselves in verse 27 of Daniel. And don't be unclear about what this is about to say. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offer. And we get that, his crucifixion. It's the next verse that concerns me. And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even unto the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. What kind of enigmatic statement is that? What's the guy that does all the Nostradamus? It sounds like a Nostradamus statement. It doesn't help that it's written in King James English, but it's really not that difficult just look in the commentary, they give a better representation than I do, but think about this. Jesus in Matthew 23, verse 38, right before his crucifixion, turned to the Jews and said, Behold, your house is what? Is left unto you desolate. And on Calvary's cross, when he was being crucified, in Matthew 27, verse 51, the veil of the temple was ripped from top to bottom, which was impossible by human hands. It signified that what was no longer in there. Nobody could look in there without being slain by the presence of God. And now the curtain was ripped and everyone could peer in there. And it told them that the presence of God was gone. His house was now desolate. Why was it desolate though? What took place? This is what Daniel is trying to tell us in John chapter 2. You remember, he was overturning the money tables. And they said, well, well, what sign will you do to prove to us that you have the power to do this? And he said, tear down this temple. And in three days, I'll build it. And what did they say? It took 46 years for us to build this. And you're going to rebuild it in three days? 
they rejected the true tabernacle, the real temple, the one that came down from heaven, the one that went back up into the heavens. They rejected the real message of righteousness by faith in that temple, and they accepted one that was built on earth. They couldn't get their minds off the brick and the mortar and the buildings. And they were deceived. And this is what Paul said. This is what the desolation was about. Romans 10 verse 3. <clears throat> Romans 10 verse 3. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God, that caused the desolation. When they rejected the righteousness that God provided for them in this Messiah that showed up prophetically just like God said He would. You have to not doubt who you serve because prophecy says you're serving the right Messiah. And this Messiah would come and not start wars, not give us some wonderful proverbs to live by, but would offer up His life and give us what real righteousness is. And they rejected that because they wanted a Messiah that came and glorified the buildings. What did Jesus say about the buildings when the disciples said, look at all these beautiful buildings? He said, I tell you, these buildings will not stand. Not one stone will be left upon another about the buildings. Get your mind off the buildings and get them on me, the real temple, the real tabernacle, where real righteousness is. And the irony of what Daniel has just said is this. Because they were made desolate, the desolators would come. And he's talking about the Roman Empire. Because their house was made desolate by the rejection of the Messiah, then the desolators would come. And guess what happened to the temple? It actually did get tore down. And it is the moral of the story. When you reject real righteousness, when you reject the real gospel, you become desolate and the desolator shows up. As Jesus said, I'll remove your candlestick. If we're not preaching the gospel that he gave us, we can become a desolate church. This gospel is the cure for all that ails us as a church. The abomination, Daniel says, is poured out. The rejection of the gospel it is an abomination that makes one desolate because when you reject the real gospel that we have been giving to you for a year and a half here, you are dooming your marriage. You're dooming your kids. You're dooming your church, your family, your life, your future. Everything that lays in front of you, you are choosing a road that's going to take you away from the only thing that can save us. And not just save us for eternity, but save us in this life. It was what was meant to be taught in our seminary. How in the world can you go six years through a graduate course and come out and not know this stuff and not preach it and not be on fire by it? How can that happen? How can you go through Southwestern or through College Dale or through any of our universities and come out and not know the gospel that God has given this church to preach? How can that happen? How can we sell out for a social gospel or trying to be like everyone else? How does that happen? But it has happened and it is time that at least in this little place on the earth that we get our mind back on the message that God has given us to preach. If we don't preach it, if we don't teach it, I'm telling you the reason why God gave us a church school here was to prepare our children for this. Amen. The reason why we have Pathfinders, Carlos, is for this. Amen. The reason why we have youth groups, AY, Abide, it is for this. Amen. Everything we do here should be gearing us and pointing towards understanding the depth of this message that is broad. I get it. It's deep. I know. It's complicated. It takes time to go through it. But as you go through it, there is this wonderful process of love that develops in your heart to God. One that after a while you get into it and you start seeing it everywhere and you're like, God, have mercy. Like Daniel, you go to your knees and say, Lord, to me belongs shame of face. But in that that learning and that discovery like we have watched Daniel go through time and time at every chapter. 
we will grow closer to our Lord. We'll have a faith that's fixed on something that is rock solid, not shifting sands. It can no longer be optional anymore. Anything that we fill it with is what the Bible calls wood, hay, and stubble. It's worthless. That's the purpose of April 1st here. I pray every one of you are here. Every single one of you. All your kids, all your family, all your friends. We are going to begin a journey. It's not perfect. I'm telling you, I've got a lot to learn about myself, but we are going to start a journey where we learn how to actually be remnant Seventh-day Adventist people who preach the two-phase ministry of Christ in His heavenly sanctuary to prepare the world for the second coming of Christ. Amen. We're going to learn to do that. The Scripture, the story in Daniel, if you read it, it ends very weird. It ends ominously. It just stops. It just ends with nothing. Normally when he's in the poetic verse, he goes back to the prose and ends with a comment. He doesn't hear. It's like after he reads this and sees this, he just goes what we would call a mic drop, right? But without the hubris, without the little catchy. It's like Daniel is reading this and seeing this. And if he thought the atonement, the day of judgment beginning was wonderful, which we do, we focus so much on that atonement, but this Daniel was like, no words, just ends the chapter. And now you know why God brought Daniel into a place of prayer first. Now you know why he humbled his heart and said, Daniel, you need, your heart must be right, you must be in confession, you must understand before I can reveal this to you. Because when I reveal this to you, it is you are entering into the Holy of Holies. You are entering into the salvation of the world. You are entering into the vindication of my eternal kingdom that you can't even begin to imagine. In church, you have been called to bear that message to the world. It is time as a church that we enter into the prayer of Daniel. That we enter into the mindset of Daniel before we try to handle this thing called the sanctuary. It is time that we stop just playing cheeky number games. Right? It is time that we take the numbers and present the God that gave the numbers, present the gospel. Do you want to enter into that prayer life of Daniel? So that we can explain like Daniel, right? And if we do, then God will shine his face on this sanctuary. On you, you, your little sanctuary, but the sanctuary as a church and the sanctuary message as a whole. And we have been promised that this message goes to the world with the speed and swiftness of Gabriel, with the power of the loud cry, with the force of the latter rain message, and the world, the world hears it above everything else. You don't have to be eloquent, strong, or bold. You just have to speak it. And if you'll set your heart like Daniel by the river Uli, if you'll start your heart like Daniel to look into the old prophecies of Je Jeremiah, God will reveal to you these truths. If you take time with it, God will bless you. And you will be a voice in this world that prepares the world to meet their Savior. Let's have prayer. Our Father in heaven, with all our living grateful hearts, we have recognized the the cry of Daniel in his prayer and realize that, that we need to learn that type of prayer, that mindset. And we too need to be looking into old Jeremiah along with everything else that has been written. God, help us to excise this world out of our life. Help us to turn off the televisions, shut down the Facebook. Help us to tune out the world for just a little while in our life and spend what's left of our life in this world looking into these understandings of prophecies, looking deeper and deeper into the gospel message that we may present it to a world in a way that you have promised to bless when it's presented that way. And when we present it that way, God, we'll find our loved ones coming into the faith, our children being excited about it again, our church growing and the world saved and prepared to meet you. God, help us, we pray in all of this. 
Lead us with your spirit. Oh, God divine. Well, Father, please bless your church today. And come April the 1st, God, we ask that you would pour out such a spirit of learning and knowledge and experience and validating growth from your behalf that we will be mind blown away. Lord, bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.